Hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining me, Brandon Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine. We're back again for video number five in my series of Mastering Diagnostics with me. If you recall from last time, video number four featured content relating to capturing uh, a customized PID list. Building a customized PID list with your scan tool to only view the data that you wish to see. And every time I build a data list, a customized data list, I want to do so in a fashion that this data tells a story. It tells me what's wrong with the vehicle, what symptoms I'm experiencing, how the vehicle is being driven, and equally as important is how the vehicle is responding to these symptoms or faults. So today's video is going to follow up on that going a little bit deeper. Today I've actually introduced a fault on my 2007 Honda Civic and we are going to be using the data gathered from our diagnostic scan tool to determine what's wrong and what direction to head in. So before I get started, I do want to take a moment to thank my friend Melissa Gomez at All Data. She sent me this diagnostic tool that I'm going to be interfacing the vehicle. I've never had my hands on this tool before and I'm real excited to try it out. So let's see how it performs. Thanks again, Melissa. So here's the scenario. The vehicle comes into the shop and it's got a check engine light on and a stored DTC P0401 pertaining to incorrect or insufficient EGR flow. Now the issue is if you read the book, if you read service information like we should when we're unfamiliar with systems, you will realize that the EGR valve separates the intake manifold from the exhaust stream. Now the job of the EGR valve is to reintroduce exhaust gases and those exhaust gases are inert, meaning they won't combust. They simply take up space and they do nothing. But the idea behind them taking up space inside a combustion chamber is the fact that if that combustion chamber contains EGR gases, there is less room for fresh air, oxygen, and fuel. And if that's the case, it's going to hinder performance and reduce the impact that that combustion event has on pushing that piston down and contributing to the rotation of the crankshaft. So with that being said, when the EGR valve is commanded open under certain loaded, medium loaded conditions, that exhaust gas is being reintroduced to the intake manifold. And as the pistons descend on their induction stroke, not only do they draw in fresh air and fuel charge, but they also draw in the reintroduced inert exhaust gases. Those exhaust gases take up space, reduce the impact the combustion event has, and therefore lower cylinder temperatures. And with those lower cylinder temperatures, it's a lot harder to produce that dangerous gas, the oxides of nitrogen, that we are trying to manage inside every internal combustion engine. So the problem is this. When we have a restricted EGR port, for instance, when we have a condition that's going to cause insufficient flow, if that condition were, or fault I should say, was centralized to the overall system, that's going to have a drastic reduction in the impact the opening of the EGR valve will have on manifold pressure. Said another way, let me back up and begin like this. As pistons rotate with the crankshaft and they begin to draw air from the intake manifold on their induction stroke, those pistons are going to inhale air. And as those pistons inhale air, if they do so at a rate that is more so than the closed throttle plate is willing to allow, we are going to in fact draw that intake manifold into a negative state of pressure, otherwise known as vacuum. So if running down the road and we have the vehicle at a set RPM, we are going to have an intake manifold vacuum that is relatively steady, a negative pressure that is relatively steady. Upon the introduction of EGR dilution, when we actually command the EGR valve on, that EGR valve is going to open and it's going to connect the intake manifold to the exhaust stream. Said another way, we just reintroduced a vacuum leak. Now the vacuum leak isn't to fresh air, it's to the inert exhaust. But it is indeed a vacuum leak. So that stored manifold vacuum that we see through the eyes of the MAP sensor is going to dissipate the moment the EGR valve opens. That's what's supposed to happen. 
if we have a restriction that limits the EGR valve's ability to reintroduce inert exhaust gases to the intake manifold, that vacuum leak that's going to be reintroduced when the EGR valve is opened up is simply not going to be as big as it was before. Therefore, it is going to have less impact on the MAP sensor change, the MAP sensor signal change. And this is what the PCM uses to determine, in many cases, EGR valve insufficient flow characteristics. So I want to introduce to you a new scenario, perhaps. What I just described was an EGR restriction that was common to all cylinders in a centralized location. Imagine this scenario when we are dealing with a system of an EGR design that has individual EGR runners leading to each cylinder one at a time. A scenario could exist where one or more, but not all, of those EGR runners are restricted. With that being said, we could still have an EGR valve that opens normally and introduces inert exhaust gases back to the intake manifold via that vacuum leak we just introduced. And as a result, the MAP sensor signal will still change, just like the PCM anticipates it changing. With that being said, we are not going to get an EGR, insufficient flow rate failure, yet we could still experience a drivability issue. So in a scenario like that, we are going to be using information from the data list to help us as technicians make diagnostic decisions without relying on a DTC to be flagged. So what I have on my screen here is a cropped scan tool capture from a vehicle experiencing just what I described. We have not a centralized distribution network for EGR exhaust gases. We've got the EGR valve that reintroduces the EGR gases to the intake manifold. However, they, tra they travel down individual runners, individual tunnels, if you will, to all four of the cylinders in this case. Now this, I know it's hard to see the VIN, and it doesn't matter, but this is from a 2002 Honda Accord 2.2 liter four-cylinder engine. And the issue was this vehicle was actually setting a lean DTC, a P0171. And the idea behind this capture is as follows. Before we analyze this data, I just want to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, as I drove this vehicle, I noticed only at certain times this vehicle starved for fuel, and therefore my fuel trim was elevated to indicate an enrichment scenario. It was trying to add fuel to compensate for a lean condition. Now, logic will tell you if we were suffering from fuel delivery due to something like a restricted fuel filter or a poorly performing fuel pump, that vehicle's faults would tend to surface more so under heavier load when the demand for fuel is higher and would be less likely to surface under low demand situations like idle or light cruise. However, when I tipped into the throttle and I got into it at about mid-range, 30, 35 miles an hour. That's when I saw the largest increase in fuel trim. So I realized at that time I was not dealing with a fuel delivery issue per se, nothing pertaining to fuel pump performance or restricted injectors or anything of that nature. But I also realized that due to the nature of when this fault occurred, it was likely related to EGR because that's when the EGR was typically commanded open the most. So what I did was I plotted information, I built a customized PID list just as we discussed in last month's video, and it told the whole story. And here's the story as follows. As you can see, I've indicated what trace belongs to what PID based upon color. And down here is throttle position. So as I tipped into the throttle, my EGR valve began to open. And as you can see, my short-term fuel trim started to climb. This pink cursor that falls down the center of this trace here is the point on each one of these graphs that is indicated here in text format. So my throttle position was just slightly open. My EGR valve was commanded open for about 2 volts. That's my pinnel position. My injector pulse width was at about 5.8 milliseconds. But all this occurred with short-term fuel trim exceeding 15% positive. Now, what I want you to take notice about graphical format 
layouts here with, with scan tool PIDs is as follows. We can see trends occurring. And what I want you to take notice to is the short-term fuel trade pink PID as well as the EGR open red PID. They follow each other. Said another way, every time my EGR valve opened, I had to add 15% short-term fuel trim. So why did I tell you all that? Believe me, it wasn't to waste your time. It's to help you understand why this data means so much to me. What I explained earlier about EGR valve dilution is when we open up the EGR valve and we reintroduce those inert exhaust gases, they take up space in the cylinder, virtually making the cylinder a lot smaller and reducing the overall effect the combustion event has. It's going to reduce its temperatures. But here's the part I left out, and I did so on purpose to save it for this point in the video. When we reintroduce that EGR gas and we are taking up space, we are in fact displacing oxygen. The oxygen content, along with the fuel that once fed that cylinder, is being shoved aside to make room for the inert EGR gas. So when that oxygen gets displaced by the EGR gases, we have to make a change to fuel delivery in order to maintain that air to fuel ratio that we desire. So if we get rid of oxygen, we have to get rid of some fuel. So what happens is when the PCM commands the EGR valve open and it sees the correlating change in MAP sensor signal, the PCM realizes that the EGR gases in fact made it to the intake manifold. And it anticipates EGR dilution. In other words, it anticipates the oxygen being displaced. So at that point, the PCM is automatically going to reduce fuel injector pulse width to maintain that air-fuel ratio. Now, in our scenario, with the individual EGR gas runners leading to the individual cylinders, and a handful of them are restricted, the PCM with the change in MAP sensor signal is going to, in fact, reduce fuel delivery to all cylinders. However, you and I know, because of the restriction that is present in the EGR stream, that displacement of oxygen never took place. So we are running extremely lean at this point in time. So with that oxygen being displaced, here's what happens. The PCM sees the change in MAP sensor signal when the EGR valve opens. As a result, the PCM anticipates EGR dilution, meaning it anticipates the oxygen being displaced from the cylinders. The PCM will then automatically reduce injector pulse width to all four cylinders in order to maintain the air-fuel ratio. If we reduce oxygen, we have to reduce fuel in order to maintain that air-fuel ratio. So in our scenario, if we have four cylinders with four individual EGR runners and three of them are restricted severely, all of the EGR dilution is going to head to one cylinder, meaning we are going to displace a lot of oxygen from that cylinder. And although we remove some of the fuel because the PCM anticipated EGR dilution, it did not anticipate that much EGR dilution. And as a result, these cylinders are going to make the exhaust stream appear very lean. So this is why short-term fuel trim was extremely elevated every time the EGR valve opened. So in order to save some time, I'm just going to tell you a story rather than show you. And you'll have to take my word for it. Knowing what you and I just discussed regarding EGR flow and the related changes in map sensor signal and fueling strategy, I applied that knowledge to the vehicle I'm working on today. Not a 2002 Honda Accord, but a 2007 Honda Civic. And when I analyzed the same data, although knowing this vehicle had an EGR insufficient flow characteristic, I did not see the correlating changes in fuel trim that I anticipated seeing. In fact, I really didn't even feel a performance issue at all. 
I did some reading, like we always should, to educate ourselves on the vehicle we are working on. Understand there's, a, there's many ways to skin a cat, and there's many ways to accomplish a goal uh, regarding vehicles and emissions control devices. So reading the associated text that came with this picture, I figured it was just easy to explain it to you while working our way through this grift. Here we have the throttle position. Uh, the dashed line represents commanded EGR valve position, and the solid line represents actual, meaning the normal delay that occurs from command to response. Down here we have the map sensor reflecting vacuum in the intake manifold and the correlating change that would be expected when the EGR valve is open, and this is what happens when the valve is commanded open to perform the self-test for the OBD2 uh, exhaust gas recirculation valve monitor. So as we decelerate, the PCM is going to command the EGR valve open. And if the EGR valve is not stuck and the pinnal position sensor is working correctly, we're going to see that change as well, indicated the solid line. When the EGR valve is commanded all the way open, we should see the MAP sensor signal rise, indicating a loss of vacuum due to that vacuum leak we introduced when we open up the EGR valve. If we cross this threshold here, this is what the PCM would expect to see and would indicate that the system is in fact performing normal. However, if we perform that same test, same exact scenario happening here and here, except this time with restricted EGR ports, although the PCM commanded the EGR valve open and it did in fact open, Although there was a correlating change in MAP sensor signal voltage, the PCM was not satisfied because it didn't cross this threshold here. So this would indicate a flow rate failure and set our P0401. So when we are dealing with a flow code, it's obvious that we have to drive this vehicle to get it to perform the test and fail. But I want to show you some other information that we could look at once we, once we understand how the system works, how we get creative, we can look at some diagnostic data right inside the work bay and not have to venture out into the road. And lots of times this works out to our favor because we don't have to drive the vehicle, we don't have to get out in the traffic, we don't have to spend any more time than is necessary to diagnose the problem. So like I said, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Let's investigate how to do that and then we'll head out to the car. So in this scenario with the 2002 Honda Civic, and the graph data I displayed for you. In years past, that is how we managed EGR dilution and how we compensated for it with a change in air-fuel ratio by way of fuel injector pulse width. But times have changed and we do things a little bit differently now and this shows the importance of having good service information. Doing some digging in service information, I am referencing my all data repair access service information system. And I've pulled up some information correlating to the EGR valve found in the advanced diagnostic section of Honda Service Information System. And what I came upon here is quite interesting. Honda, in this era of vehicle, utilizes an air fuel ratio compensation value. So I'm going to zoom on this and describe what's going on here. When we introduce exhaust gas recirculation, that's indicated here by this solid trace. Every time the trace goes towards the top of the screen here, it indicates the EGR valve is open. And every time the trace descends down this way, it indicates the EGR valve is closing. What we have here, the dashed line is a filtered value, and we can ignore that for the time being. Just focus on this solid dashed line here. This represents air fuel ratio control fuel compensation value. Said another way, every time the EGR valve opens up and we displace oxygen, like we should, the air-fuel ratio tends to go a bit rich. Why? Because the fuel is still in the cylinder. So unlike the older design um, software that will compensate fuel delivery with the opening of the EGR valve and the change in MAP sensor signal, I'd call that a proactive approach to EGR dilution. This vehicle is not proactive, but in fact reactive. So said another way, it can't really be fooled. If we open up the EGR valve, instead of making a change, it's simply gonna monitor through the eyes of the wideband air-fuel ratio sensor, change in air-fuel ratio. 
When it sees the change, only then will it make the change to inject or pulse with. So with that being said, what we just learned through all data repair system is that this vehicle doesn't behave like an older era vehicle. So my approach to this drivability symptom yielded me inconclusive evidence. I didn't see a correlating change in fuel trim to indicate what I know to be evidence of an EGR restriction. Knowing what I now know, I'm going to reintroduce the scan tool that Melissa from All Data provided for me, and we are going to get the evidence we need to condemn this EGR system. So we're at the vehicle. We are going to be implementing the scan tool. And again, the idea is to gather data in a fashion that tells a story. And that story should tell how the vehicle is being operated and what is occurring, meaning if there's a fault present, how is it being exhibited? And equally as important, how is the vehicle responding? So any good scan tool should be able to yield you that information. So we're gonna implement the all data diagnostic tool and see what I can do. So we'll launch the diagnostic scan tool and see where it takes us. So today I'm gonna to build this vehicle on the enhanced side of the PCM. So this is a Honda. It's identified it by way of VIN, so that's good news. And the only thing we have to select here is automatic transmission. So we're going to choose enhanced powertrain. And allow the scan tool to gather the information from the vehicle. We don't want the entire vehicle's worth of data. So we'll go to enhanced powertrain. We're going to come over here and build a live data PID list. So this scan tool breaks it down into menus, which is neat in some scenarios, right? If you're looking at, uh, let's say, O2 sensor information, it's going to give you only information based upon oxygen sensors. So we're going to go to all data group types. And again, I'm trying to choose data that is going to tell a story. So I definitely want to see air fuel ratio because that's going to be like having a gas analyzer in the tailpipe. I want to see EGR lift. That's how I know how far the EGR valve is being commanded open. I would like to see fuel injector. This will give me injector pulse width or on time so we can see how the fuel is being delivered or how that change occurs when the EGR valve is opening. And I want to see a corrective factor. So we will go with short-term and long-term fuel trim. Perfect. Our customized PID list is right here. And what we are going to do is put this in a graphical format Right now we're in meter view. Let's see what grid view looks like. Okay, so grid view offers bar graphs, but I want something a bit more practical. You guys know me by now. I really like my graphs. So we can see our air fuel ratio is being plotted up top, and it's about 14.7, which you guys will probably recognize as stoichiometry, and that's what we should expect. Here is our EGR valve lift, and uh, I don't know if you can hear, I have the engine running right now. We're at idle, but our valve lift indicates zero inches because we are not commanding any EGR. With the vehicle at idle, we are sitting here at a steady 2.8 milliseconds. And our fuel trim is just a total of, this is 4% negative, and this is 5% negative, so a total fuel trim of 10% negative. And um, currently, I have my purge valve ticking away. Um, I am very low on fuel at this point in time, so I don't expect a heavy fuel vapor load. And it is relatively cool out today, so the fuel is not as volatile. And I just started the engine just a short while ago. So I've decided to add one more PID to that list. To recap, we've got air fuel ratio, because we want to see basically having a gas analyzer in the tailpipe how the vehicle is correcting for EGR dilution. Um, fuel injector pulse width, which is going to show the actual change. 
in fuel injector on time from when the EGR valve is open and when the EGR valve is not open. Um, a third point of reference is going to be engine RPM because what I'm going to be doing is placing the vehicle engine in a loaded situation. I'm going to place the vehicle in, in, in gear and, and hold the brake pedal steadily. And I'm going to slowly introduce accelerator pedal position because I want to load the engine and force the PCM to open up the EGR valve. And of course I'm going to have long term and short term fuel trim on there to show any corrective factor taking place. We are going to do this to demonstrate the fault and then after we repair the fault we're going to repeat that process and we're going to see the change. Okay so the engine is running I'm in gear I've got my foot on the brake and if you watch engine speed here I'm going to accelerate the engine with the vehicle in gear and I'm going to do so and hold it and while we watch the EGR valve open. If you listen I'm going to take the engine up to about 2,000 rpms and we see the EGR valve open. I'm going to hold it for a few seconds to allow it to stabilize and then I'm going to take my foot off the accelerator and let everything close again. and I will end my recording and we're going to repeat this process with the vehicle broken. So we've captured the data under normal operating conditions. Now when I turned off the camera I reintroduced the fault and I'm not telling you what it is until later because we're going to let the data tell us what's happened. I'm going to repeat the process again capturing the same exact data under the same operating conditions and we're going to evaluate the data away from the vehicle when we're comfy and cozy at our work bay so we can do some thinking. So the vehicle is at idle once again I've reintroduced the fault I'm going to place the vehicle in gear and I am once again going to start my recording and take the vehicle up to almost the exact same RPM before, about 2,000 RPMs. And we can see the EGR valve opening. And I'm going to let it stabilize. I will then end my recording and we will go evaluate the data. So let me explain what I have on the screen here. On the left side of the screen, surrounded in green, is a data capture from the vehicle before the fault was introduced. On the right side of the screen, surrounded in red, is the same data capture. However, this has the fault induced. And we're going to compare the two, excuse me, the three PIDs here on the screen. Now, what I'm not showing on the screen, simply because there was not enough room to accommodate all the PIDs we had captured, was short-term and long-term fuel trim. And although the long-term remained exactly the same from capture to capture, the short-term varied from capture to capture by only 1%. So, for all intents and purposes, there was almost no shift in fuel trim at all. What we can see here, um, underneath where it says Live Data, Graphed View, on both uh, on, on both captures is our air fuel ratio PID and regardless of what the number are the numbers are you can see that they are almost the same as far as the range goes the scaling on both graphs as the EGR valve was opened up just over an inch of lift and exhaust gases were introduced our air fuel ratio sensor detected that and automatically compensated with fuel injector pulse. On the faulted capture, the same scenario occurs. As we accelerate the vehicle in gear and the EGR valve opens, we don't see hardly any change in air fuel ratio. This is because this system is reactive rather than proactive. And what I'm getting at is, although here we are introducing exhaust gases, 
and here we are not introducing exhaust gases. In both scenarios, the PCM is watching the air fuel ratio sensor for a shift, a correlating shift in air fuel ratio in the exhaust content. And because there was no shift on this side, where there was a shift on this side, it's automatically compensated for through fuel injector pulse width. So my point is we are not going to see a correlating change in fuel trim as we would on older vehicles. To be a little bit more accurate, I decided to take a single screenshot by placing the cursor somewhere within the graph and capturing it for both the good capture that we just displayed in graphical format and the bad capture displayed in graphical format. So as I was saying, we are operating the vehicle at approximately 2100 RPMs. It's almost impossible for me to match the exact engine speed, but we're close enough. The same load and RPM range. Our long-term fuel trim is at 0.93 and 0.94, so we are within one-tenth where short-term hasn't changed at all. Our injector pulse width for both captures is 8.48, and both our EGR valves are open, and this represents inches. So this is one-tenth of an inch more than this, hardly anything at all, and an inch is a, a fairly large opening for an EGR valve. So there is no confusion here. I'm pointing out the fact that this data that is on the screen does not show the fault. It's because of the way this vehicle determines air fuel ratio and, and EGR dilution. What it's looking at, how it responds, it's reactive rather than proactive. So I'm not finding what I need to see here. What I would instead do is go back to the scan tool and look at changes in manifold pressure as compared to EGR valve lift. And when I do that, I do indeed see that the EGR valve opens and that there is a correlating change in MAP sensor voltage or pressure inside the intake manifold when the EGR valve fault is not present. However, when the EGR valve fault is present, when I open up the EGR valve, when it's commanded open, there is no correlating change in MAP sensor signal. And if that fault lasted long enough, it would in fact trigger a DTC. So some of you likely figured out what's probably wrong with this vehicle, but I'm going to show you. Here is our fault. We've got a substitute EGR valve, nothing wrong with it at all. And we simply plugged it into the harness. And what this simulates is an EGR valve circuitry that has no issues a valve that properly opens when commanded. However, since the real EGR valve is still interfaced between the exhaust stream and the intake manifold and the valve isn't open, we did not introduce any true EGR back to the engine. So what I was trying to demonstrate was the fact that although service information gives us info pertaining to the nature of a fault with an EGR flow issue, and how the PCM determines whether a fault is present or not, um, we can still reflect on other PIDs to help us make diagnostic decisions, especially when it comes to trying to reproduce a failure to trigger a DTC. Sometimes that takes time. So I'd much rather look at data to infer there's a problem, even if I can't reproduce the DTC itself. It's all about educating yourself on how a system works and the components involved in that system to, to accomplish that goal. And that's exactly what my all data repair system did for me. It gave me the information I needed to educate myself on the functionality of this vehicle's EGR system. And what it is I had to look for in my data PIDs to make a diagnostic decision. And that's where the all data diagnostic tool came into play. The tool functions very well. It gives a really nice graphing uh, view of the data and allows for action reaction comparative measure. So that's what I like about it. So again, I want to thank Melissa Gomez specifically and All Data for loaning me the diagnostic tool. I was really impressed. And I hope you all join me next time for video number six in Mastering Diagnostics with me, Brandon Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine. We'll see you next time. Take care.